not just for the purpose of exchanging oxygen, but for exchanging CO2, which is a key component to us being able to balance the pH of our blood and the pH of our body. Everybody understand that? Separately, the conduction zone has the mucociliary escalator. The mucociliary escalator. Because why? Well, what's the top side of the larynx? The epiglottis. And if, you, if those of you who had me for 2085, what type of epithelium would I find on the underside of the epiglottis? First of all, what type of what type of cartilage is the epiglottis? Elastic, Elastic. Elastic cartilage. And what type of epithelium would I find on the underside of the epiglottis? No, epithelium. What type of epithelium would I find? Pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium with goblet cells. Remember that special one that you only find on the trachea? And the underside of the epiglottis. Why? Ah, because they're gonna they're gonna secrete and sweep. Secrete and sweep. Secrete and sweep. So the idea is, hey, we're swallowing our lungs, functional lungs, as adults, even as children. We're gonna secrete approximately one liter of fluid a day in the lung. And it's gonna be swallowed. Did everybody hear me? It's going to be swallowed and you don't even know it. Every time, you, every time you just swallow, you don't realize that you're just swallowing because you just swallowed the mucus that was coming from your lung. A dry swallow is you swallowing the mucus from your lung without you even knowing it because the mucociliary escalator is sweeping, 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 trapping, sweeping, trapping, sweeping because we're secreting mucus. What else is found in that mucus? What very important protein is found in that mucus produced by B cells? Or plasma cells. The antibodies. What antibody in particular? IgG. A secretory antibody is on the question. It was one of the questions on the test. It's in the form of a dimer. That was a hit. But IgG is a good guess because it's the IgG is bloodstream. Bloodstream only. Bloodstream only and passes through the placenta. Passes through the placenta. Right? That's that's a big component here. If I were to put IG, IgG from maternal, goes right in the placenta, goes right into embryo. Yeah? <laughs> that was another question on the test. IgD and IgM are B cell receptors. IgD is the hypersensitivity reaction. IgM is a pentamer in bloodstream. Oh, those were on the test too, weren't they? Yeah. There they were, and I? I said it in class, didn't I? I did say it in class, I did. And I said it more than once. I said it more than once. <laughs> <laughs> so it's if people say that I'm unfair, I'm not unfair, that's not true. If my tests are hard, yeah, they're hard, I'm not lying. <laughs> but I, 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 like, I yeah. like this test better because you had, you know, yes. like if we need three of them, we gotta get you. Yeah, you can figure out the others, exactly. Yeah. That's the idea, right? <laughs> I mean, I gave you all five instead of yeah. just giving you three of them, right? I gave you all five, so you knew that one of them had to match each one of them. So, you know, I, I try to make it fair. I try to make it fair. I try to make it challenging and fair at the same time because I need to know who's really understanding the material. Because, see, when you guys come to me and say, oh, I want you to write a letter of rec for me, I have a way of writing your letter of rec to reflect not the actual grade you got, but where you fall in the, in the whole class, in the cohort. And I write that down. So I write it as a percentage, which is a percentile. So that's, you know, that's, yes. Yeah. So there's a method behind Professor P's madness. Okay. So are there any questions so far on this, guys? Any questions so far? Uh, just to recap, so the tertiary bronch bronchies, the only one, because you have two, five. No, there's a, a shit ton. I'm just not naming it. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a shit ton of them. This is all. Increase and then increase in number. So there, there's more of these. There's more of these. There's more of these than there are these, obviously, right? Just imagine it like a, like, so this is how I, when I finally grabbed somebody's lungs, right, and like had them in my hand, then I tried to picture a way of, of explaining it to somebody else, but on the inside. 
Because on the outside, it doesn't reflect on what we're, really, what we're really trying to explain to you. On the outside, it stays kind of smooth because it, it's because it has a, an outer layer called the visceral pleura, which will try to encapsulate what are these functional grapes. So think about this. Everybody know, everybody ever, you know, everybody ever go to the store and buy grapes? Grapes are like one of my favorite fruits in the world, right? Especially like the plum grapes, the ones that they make prunes with, the nice fat purple ones that you dry them out, right? And they and they make, I mean not prunes, they make raisins. They make raisins, they're super, 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 super sweet. Um, so if you imagine that, right? Imagine them being really, 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 really small, right? And then and then you have lots of them, right? Then you have all these grapes on branches, yeah? Well, that's what the lungs look like. They really look like grapes on branches. They start out as a lung bud. But little by little, it's the bud is going to grow out into a larynx, trachea. And you understand, I'm not, I, I'm just talking to you about the, so first, here's the thing. What I drew up on the board, that line represents the epithelium. Does everybody understand that? So let me ask you a question. What epithelium would I have if, if this is the beginning of what would be my primitive GI tract, right? Then I would then have, uh, let's say, I would have my, my tongue, my, the roof of my mouth, right? My teeth, my maxilla, then I'd have my oral cavity, so there would be my nose, right? Right? Awesome. So, so look, so what winds up happening is, is that you can see that at least initially, I have a nose, a nasal cavity, an oral cavity with a tongue, my nasal cavity has to drain into my nasal pharynx, my oral cavity has to drain into my oral pharynx, you understand? And then what winds up having to happen is, I, I drew it kind of off, right? My lung bud should be on this side. Because then, then I develop my trachea, and then everything else. So I have my liver and my pancreatic buds, but my lung bud is going to develop into all those structures there, and it's not done because I don't, I can't just make a conduction zone. I also have to make what a zone for the purpose of exchange. Everybody got me, and that zone is referred to as the respiratory zone. Thank you for reading ahead, All right? Because the respiratory zone, well, terminal bronchioles lead into um, respiratory bronchioles. And respiratory bronchioles lead into alveolar ducts. And alveolar ducts lead into alveolar sacs. And then once you get into alveolar sacs, you get into alveoli. Well, sure enough, the alveoli are simple squamous epithelium. Because that's the thinnest cell layer I can have in the alveoli, and that's the purpose of the alveoli is the gas exchange. Does everybody understand? I don't want nothing else. Don't you give me nothing else. Don't you give me cuboidal. You got me bent if you think I'm going to work with cuboidal. You better give me simple squamous. Do you understand, guys? And that's the simple squamous of the alveoli. That's not to say that, but don't forget, vasculature coming from right side heart is going to the lung, then go to the left side heart. Everyone agree? So the pulmonary trunk is going to pulmonary, uh, left and right pulmonary veins, right? I mean, pulmonary arteries, because they're going away from the heart, right? But they're deoxygenated blood. They're going to go into pulmonary capillaries. Well, pulmonary capillaries also have a simple squamous epithelium. Everyone agree? Oh, wait a minute. Hold up, Professor P. So what are you telling me? Oh, so, so my, my right ventricle leads out to my pulmonary trunk. And my pulmonary trunk leads out to my pulmonary arteries. And my pulmonary arteries are going to lead out to my pulmonary capillaries. And then, does everybody see this? My pulmonary capillaries are what? Simple squamous. Does everybody see? 
So I have my alveoli simple squamous, my pulmonary capillary simple squamous. I got a little bit of connective tissue in between to keep them stuck together. And there I have my respiratory membrane. Did everybody hear me? There I have my respiratory membrane. The respiratory membrane consists of the smooth, the, sorry, of the simple squamous epithelium of the alveoli with its basement membrane, a small amount of connective tissue, then the basement membrane of the simple squamous epithelium of the pulmonary capillaries, and then the simple squamous of the pulmonary capillaries. Does everybody understand that, guys? And that is the interface that oxygen must traverse. You got me, guys? So this right here, between pulmonary capillaries and alveoli, you create the respiratory membrane. And it's there where we get O2, CO2 exchange. Any questions so far? Any questions? Now, uh, clinical scenario. I got a 12 year old, I got a 12 year old male. Mentira, let's make him younger. <laughs> I got a 10 year old male. He's already had, he's already had, so past med, past med history, HX, past medical history, several recurrent lung infections. That's past medical history. Kids, 10 years old, 9, 10 years old, he's had multiple lung infections. What's his problem? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, what else? Cystic fibrosis. <laughs> cystic fibrosis. How could you tell the cystic fibrosis? Salt exchange. Correct. Uh, so, so several recurrent lung infections, but that's not that won't be his only thing. He'll also have this malabsorption. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hold up. Lung issues with lung and GI. What's up with that? <laughs> what's up with that? Well, what's lung doing? Secreting mucus. What's GI doing? Secreting mucus. What cystic fibrosis do? Or it's too thick. Secretes mucus that's too thick because there's not enough water. Oh, there's not enough water because there's not enough chlorine. Oh, cystic fibrosis. But wait, on the skin, it's excess chloride. Oh, that's because the protein is flipped. In GI, it's in one direction. In skin, sweat glands, it's, on the, it's in the other direction. You may remember this when I talked about cystic fibrosis and when I talked about the positive chloride sweat test on skin and kids who have this disease. So he's got CFTR, it's called CFTR mutation. It's a chloride transmembrane protein, CFTR protein. It's a membrane protein that sits in the membrane of the cells and in sweat glands, it's gonna, it's gonna not allow the recovery of chloride. So the sweat has too much chloride on it. So your DX, your diagnosis is a positive, a positive chloride sweat test. Does that make sense, guys? And then what happens? So something else. Malabsorption. Why malabsorption? Now I'm going to give you another one. Pancreatitis. Because the pancreas is a gland. Did everybody... Oh, what? Ah, did I tell you? Did I, did I tell you? That the epithelium of the primitive GI tube gives rise to lung bud and pancreatic buds and their glands, and the lung is also a gland, at least it develops as a gland, and then later on decides it's not going to be a gland anymore, or maybe it will be, but its main job is to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide because <gasps> you got to take that first breath. Does everyone understand? But so the pancreas and the lungs would be affected as well. So would sperm. Because it's a gland, isn't it? Our sperm is generated by a testicle. Testicle acts as a gland, doesn't it? It does. So it could also be affected. 
But what it is is, guys, it's an inability, it's an inability, it's an inability to control chloride and reclaim it from sweat, and it's an inability to move chloride out into secretions. So you get the pancreatitis because the mucus secretions in the pancreas are too thick, and the enzymes that are supposed to go to GI, they get stuck in the pancreas and wind up digesting the pancreas. Kid gets pancreatitis. Do you understand, guys? Comes in with abdominal pain. Comes in complaining of abdominal pain. He leans forward and the pain goes away. Comes in with recurrent lung infection. Comes in with stool that smells because of malabsorption. Guys, are you, are you getting me? If I don't have mucus properly secreted and moist, then my secretions are thicker than normal, and I'm going to have problems with being able to get enzymes from the pancreas into the GI for me to digest the food properly. That means the food's coming out the other end undigested. That's called malabsorption. And if this is severe enough, the kid could die. It could be a severe enough transmutation, an effect, an effect on the CFTR, that the kid is, uh, I don't know, maybe two or three years old. And, and he's, he's going to die because of this, because it's that severe. Do you understand what I'm saying to you guys? Yeah? So someone who has this CFTR mutation, they call it, there's several different mutations. I think there's over 157 different mutations in this CFTR that can result in, so several different mutations in the CFTR gene that result in a protein that's bad. And that will give you some form of cystic fibrosis. How long do you think these kids are going to last? Second, third decade of life. I think the longest, maybe four decades. 40 is the old, I think the oldest, maybe 40, 43, around there. You can't fix that. No. Mm -hmm. Can't fix it. We know what causes it. We know what the whole condition is. We understand the symptoms and the nature of the disease process, but we can't do jack about it, not yet. Soon though, soon. Soon. Soon we'll be fixing everything. <laughs> Any questions, guys, on that that one? So now let's so let's talk about this, right? Because we said I said that the lung is a tube and its tendency is to collapse. Does everyone agree? Now, do you see why? That at 90, at 70, at 85, 90, 95, what's happening? Your tube is going to be more tended to collapse. Severally, your tube becomes less ed ed efficient at sweeping the mucus that you're producing every day. So the fluid will accumulate in the lung. So the mucociliary escalator over time gets weakened. And so you can understand that as time goes on, then almost all of us are destined to choke on our own secretions. And that's, that's called pulmonary failure. Look, yeah, look, look at what, what is the majority of old, older people when they get old enough, what do they die of? Complications to pneumonia? Well, guess what? Complications to pneumonia is nothing more than accumulation of fluid in the lung. Ah. Why do I want fluid to accumulate in the lung? Especially in here. See why I have a mucociliary escalator? To trap everything that's dust particles and sweep it up and away? Because I want this to be sterile and clear. So I can get exchange, good exchange of oxygen with di carbon dioxide. If fluid starts to accumulate along the respiratory membrane, then I'm not going to get exchange of oxygen. Do you understand, guys? I'm going to get a reduced exchange of oxygen. If the respiratory membrane increases in thickness, because of asbestosis. Anybody know about asbestosis? Oh, yeah. Most people don't know about this, you know why? Because most people aren't old as me. So asbestosis, you get people who used to work in industry, people who used to work for the US military. People who used to build ships for a living for the US military. People used to build homes for the US government. A lot of the old houses in Miami. A lot of old homes, we got asbestos in the inside. They used to use it as an insulator. They used to use it in brake pads. So people who worked in the industry, again, mechanics, constantly being exposed to asbestos dust. The fibers, the fibers in asbestos, 
they insert into the respiratory membrane. Is that sound like a good thing or a bad thing? A bad thing. What do you think is going to happen if I put fibers in there, guys, that I can't remove? The, the respiratory membrane is going to do what? It's going to get thicker. Did everybody see that? And if my respiratory membrane gets thicker, then how well am I exchanging oxygen across that? Poorly. You understand? Coal miners. Coal miners. Big discussion now, right, in the midterm elections. Yeah? Coal miners. Guys, they still have coal miners. As a matter of fact, coal miners back in the day in, the West, in West Virginia and Virginia Hills, when they would come home, you know what? They wind up dying. Their kids wind up dying. Their wife wind up dying before they would. Why? Because they were getting it on the skin, but they weren't getting it on the lung when they go down in there. They're wearing the masks. When they come back, their clothes are covered in it. The wife deals with the clothes. The kids playing around in the clothes and the, the soot. They breathe the stuff in. They get coal miners lung. Huh? Coal miners lung. What's coal miners lung? Same thing. The silica in the dust in the coal mines sticks to the clothing. You breathe it in. It sits in the respiratory membrane. It thickens the respiratory membrane. And you choke on your secretions. There you stand. You get less oxygen coming in, CO2 builds up, that means hypoxia with hypercapnia. You ever understand that? A decrease in oxygen delivery is referred to as hypoxia. Long-term hypoxia leads to acidosis, you understand? Then you're gonna have buildup of CO2 in the bloodstream. That's gonna to lead to another form of acidosis. Good luck with that. And sure enough, your kidneys are gonna to try to compensate for what your lung can't do anymore. Did everybody understand me? Because there are only two organs in the human body that can compensate for acid-base imbalances for the most part. <clears throat> and that is lung and the kidney. Now you have a link. <laughs> the lung and kidney acid-base imbalances. You understand, guys? So the lung is doing a lot, man. The function of the lung is something very, very, very delicate and very, very important. Separately, remember, who produces, who, who really is responsible for generating angiotensin two? The lung. Why? Ace. Ace. Guys, don't forget that. Huh. I shouldn't have to repeat that one. That one should already be embedded in your brain. The lung is responsible for producing Ace. Converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So in that case, then the lung is directly correlated to the pressure that is occurring in the, in the cardiovascular system. Alright? Everyone? Lung voice. Amazing, isn't it? Isn't it amazing? It's amazing. So now, back to my analogy. If you go and you buy this big, big, big bunch of grapes, right, that are going to represent the lung, then you got these super, 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 super small grapes, and there's multitudes, there's millions of them, millions and millions of them. And then not only that, they're so cute, they're so small, and then on top of that, they're stuck together. And they're called, those things are called alveolar pores. And this is what allows fluid to move from one sac to another. Did everybody hear me? So if fluid, if fluid comes into one sac, it has the ability to move from one sac to another. If bacteria, now let me tell you, it's dark, it's damp, it's deep, it's moist. You think bacteria is going to love it? Hell yes it is. You understand? Now you change the moisture just a little bit? Bet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then I can move from one to the other? Oh. Now I get lung infection. Everybody got me? Now that's the inside of the lung from us traveling magic school bus style, right? Through the lung. Everybody got me? But on the outside, you don't see the grapes because those grapes are covered. There's so many of them, they're so little. They're covered on the outside by a bag that's referred to as the visceral pleura. Everybody understand that? They're covered. So here you got, here you got, you got all your little bag, you got all your little bags, yeah? All your little bags. All your little bags, and they're all fused together. And then what happens? Then we're going to bag it up on the outside. And we're going to call that the visceral pleura. Okay, I'll put it as a different color. Blue. The visceral pleura is in direct contact with all those little grapes. 
And, and in between those grapes, guys, listen, in between those grapes and this visceral, uh, uh, visceral pleura, there's connective tissue that has springs in it. They call it elastin. Oh my God, did I just go back to chapter three? Chapter four. Elastic fibers and elastic, don't go elastic connective tissue. Well, we'll go elastic connective tissue because it is, it's actually elastic connective tissue. It's a form of elastic connective tissue where you find just elastin. Everybody hear me? Elastin. And that's between the connective tissue, again, what we're talking about, we're talking about between the simple squamous of the alveoli and the simple squamous of the pulmonary capillaries, right? You have this interface, there's connective tissue there. And then that same connective tissue is interfaced between what are these walls of the alveoli and this stuff, that same connective tissue reflects onto the visceral pleural. And so within that same connective tissue is, is springs, elastic springs. They're called elastin, elastin, T-I-N. And it acts like a spring, it stretches. So when I stretch the spring, what's gonna happen? It's gonna snap back. Did everybody hear me? Now watch, watch, watch how amazing this is. So there I have my visceral layer. And all for that? My parietal layer. So here I have my visceral layer of pleura and my parietal layer of pleura. And in between there, guys, there's pleural fluid. Now watch this. If I were to pull on the parietal pleura, and there's a fluid interface between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura, what's going to happen?